Okay guys, this will be the last 15 minute video I give you for the day. If what I, if I don't finish the presentation um, in this sitting, I will finish it with you on Monday. So um, your goal is to get through this last and final one. Um, some common uh, uses of enzymes in the industry, what you don't uh, necessarily understand is that enzymes are used for everything. Um, detergents. Detergents uh, use a lot of enzymes and uh, I would like for you guys to think about which detergents you think have the most proteases, the most enzymes um, that break down protein and fat stains. Can you guess which enzyme um, I'm sorry, which detergent has the most enzymes? I'll tell you on Monday. Enzymes are also used to break down starch grains in biofuels that make ethanol um, so that can be combusted. So this is a chemical reaction used by um, in biofuels. I thought it was really interesting that we use enzymes in textiles all the time and it can make cloth appear shiny. So look around the room really quick and see if there's anyone in the class with any clothing that is a little bit shiny in color that was done by an enzyme. The brewing industry, you guys are far too young to know about this, obviously, but the brewing industry uses enzymes to help with a whole bunch of processes, including clarification of the beer. Enzymes are used quite a lot in medicine and biotechnology and um, we use them for diagnostic tests. Uh, for example, pregnancy tests are have uh, very important enzymes in there that help determine the hormone for HCG if HCG is present and um, even contact lens cleaners have enzymes in them. Additionally, cutting DNA in genetic engineering, which we're going to learn in the next chapter. So super useful enzymes in biotechnology and medicine. We also have them a lot in food, fruit juices, fructose like sweeteners, renin to help cheese production. And lastly, just one more example is paper production it uses enzymes to help pulp the wood. So pharmaceutical, is huge as is food and beverage. Um, those are our two biggest enzyme users. Some um, advantages of enzyme immobilization, immobilization, sorry. Immobilizing enzymes. Basically, if we go back to this list here, what we've done is um, we can take enzymes and we can freeze them to a surface. We can attach them to a surface and essentially flush the substrates right over the top of them. Immobilizing the enzymes help make things, reactions much, much faster and um, therefore it can happen uh, much cheaper. So from that example that we used earlier where you had all those things floating around in the body, it's kind of just what ends up happening is the enzyme just happens to run into the substrate and create a reaction. And this is, uh, it works for our bodies, but as far as industry goes, it's all about money and doing it quickly. So they immobilize the enzymes. They stick them to a surface that are not floating around. Advantages of immobilizing the enzymes. First, what we can do is we can increase the concentration of the substrate. Um, because the enzyme's not changed. So if we increase the reaction of the substrate, we know that essentially if the substrate level is here and we increase it to here, we're going to get a lot more reactions happening a lot, lot faster. Eventually you increase it any more than that and nothing is going to happen. But, um, if we have the enzymes immobilized, we can increase the substrates, which is going to increase the reaction rate. Enzymes can easily be recycled many, many times. Um, they're easy to separate from the reaction mixture. So this causes um, a lot of money to be saved and they can be used again and again. So um, we can also separate the products much easier. This means that um, one reaction can be stopped at the correct time. 
so we get the right product at the right time. And stability. The stability of the enzyme um, to change in temperature and pH is increased. Uh, so it basically reduces the risk of enzymes not working as well in higher or lower temperatures or pHs. It increases the um, stability of the enzyme. For example, if we put our enzymes in detergent, and then you wash your clothes in hot water, you could essentially be breaking down the proteases ability to do its job. You could reduce the overall reaction rate by making the water too hot, but by stabilizing and immobilizing the enzymes, this helps fix that problem. It can help reduce the rate of degradation and aging, which saves money. Um, basically, to summarize what immobilizing is, they're attached to a material so that their movement is restricted. Um, many of them, basically, the enzymes are bonded together in aggregations. They can also be attached to surfaces like glass or gel beads, trapped in gels um, like gel beads. These are the most common ways to do that. Now switching gears just a teeny tiny bit, we're going to come back to immobilizing the enzymes in just a second. Um, switching gears to what is lactose intolerance? Many people think lactose intolerance is an allergy to lactose. That is actually incorrect. If you have lactose intolerance, what that means is that you lack the enzyme lactase. So lactose is made of galactose and glucose. We're going to be doing a lab on this on Tuesday. And basically, when lactose is pre or lactase is present, lactose goes away and becomes galactose and glucose. If you don't have lactase, then we're just going to have lots and lots of lactose. In the presence of lactase, we have lots and lots of glucose and galactose. Um, it's an interesting thing if you look at the overall global estimates of lactose intolerance, um, most people produce less lactase as they get older. The reason for this is, to be completely honest, after you get past the very young age, usually around five, um, you should be weaned just as, a, as an animal. We should be weaned from milk. Um, so we produce less, less lactase as we get older, which is why sometimes when you're younger, you have no problem with lactose products, but as you get older, you, you can't eat them as much because your body stops producing as much lactase. In some regions like Europe, a mutation has allowed lactase production to continue into adulthood. Um, this mutation is not in people who are lactose intolerant, obviously. But in places like Europe, this has allowed areas to maintain their ability to consume lactose longer. So for lactose intolerance, um, we are able to make lactose-free milk by essentially immobilizing enzymes on lactase beads. They then pour the milk, which has lactose on it, into and around these beads. As the milk hits and runs through these beads, the reaction's gonna happen that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. So what comes out is lactose-free. These are on the surface of alginate beads. And again, the beads themselves have immobilized enzymes on them. Um, okay, so switching gears just a little bit. Enzymes can be inhibited by other molecules, as I showed you in that video right at the very beginning. Now that you know a little bit more about enzymes and how the reactions happen, I want to explain to you the difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibition. 
So inhibitors are basically things that fit into the enzyme and prevent the substrate from entering. In one case, it's blocked. In the other case, the enzyme uh, active site has changed shape. Okay, so with competitive inhibition, the inhibitor fits into the active site. Now you can see it's not a perfect fit, but with this in the active site, that substrate can definitely not bind, it's blocked. This is going to prevent the reaction from happening further. Non-competitive inhibition, so competitive, it actually competes for the active site. Non-competitive inhibition is basically when we have a different inhibitor. Typically, this is the inhibitor from the end product. The substrate from the very end product comes back and binds to the allosteric site. When this bond happens, it's going to change the 3D conformational shape of the active site so the enzyme will not fit. This is non-competitive because it's not actually competing for the active site space, it's separate to a new location. Okay, when we're looking at this slide, this is going to summarize a few things for us. What I'm basically explaining is that the competitive inhibitor is going to block the active site, which we looked at in the previous slide. This is going to prevent the substrate from entering. If we have more competitive inhibitors, it's going the reaction rate is going to happen at a much slower rate. So if you look at this graph, this is what this is explaining. In green here, there are zero inhibitors. So the enzyme activity is going to just skyrocket, and eventually it's just going to plateau because sub, even if you inc continue to increase the substrate, there's only so many enzymes, so it's going to level out. When there's 25% inhibition, it's going to increase at a slower rate, but again, reach its maximum rate because it doesn't matter. There are no more enzymes to be bonded with. And then 50% inhibition, the reaction is only going to happen half the time. But again, it's going to plateau or reach the same location where it cannot get any higher because the number of enzymes have not changed. Without the number of, if we increase the enzymes, then this entire thing is going to change. But if the same amount of enzymes are here and all we're changing is the substrate concentration, the reaction will only happen so fast. Okay, uh, looking at this picture, we have, uh, this is an enzyme. And the enzyme is going to switch back and forth between two forms, an inactive form and an active form. Um, they're in equilibrium. They're going to basically be in the correct form based on what's needed for the reaction. So if this is, this is the active site, this is the allosteric site. So the active site, when it's full, fully open and ready for a substrate, that's in its active form. In the inactive form, nothing can bond there. So again, we've got the active site and the allosteric site, and you can see when the allosteric site is activated, the enzyme itself is in its inactive form. Nothing can bond. And when the allosteric site is not activated, the enzyme is ready to bond and is in itself active. This thing, this purple thing is called a regulatory subunit. And um, when the enzyme is inactive, it cannot do the reaction, the allosteric sites on the regulatory subunits can accept an inhibitor. So here it's ready for an inhibitor. This is an allosteric inhibitor. Again, typically this is the end product of a previous reaction and this prevents the reaction from happening. When the enzyme is in its active form, it can accept a substrate and the reaction can happen. So in this form, there's no product happening because the allosteric sites have been filled and no reaction can happen. And here, the product um, can be made because 
the substrates can fit into the active site and the enzymes can um, create the reaction. So we're going to stop there and I'm going to finish the presentation with you guys in person on Monday. Great job today.